Well, I very much appreciated Roger's remarks, and I think I agree with the very large majority of them. Um, asset, I've always thought asset prices, the real wealth, um, had a hugely important impact through the demand side on unemployment. And so we very much agree um, on that. Um, of course, what I've been doing is estimating conditional models, which provide partial insights. They don't solve out for general equilibrium. We need to incorporate those conditional models um, into larger models that uh, allow all the feedbacks to operate. Um, but I think they help a great deal in, in that process. <coughs> So let me open the floor for a few comments or, or questions. Given that the, the two issues are obviously interrelated, so we have, uh, we can also come back at the end uh, to uh, to what is being discussed now. But we uh, can uh, take uh, have a first uh, time for uh, for a few uh, for a few comments. And I guess we can have a special rule that uh, uh, Vitor, you always have the right to ask the first question <laughs> if you want. No, it's an option. So, is there any? No? Yes, Philip, please. Uh, please be short, Philip. If I may. So, the shortest I can. Um, Concentration is not a very good me necessary measure, a good measure of market power. So you, th you showed that one chart on inflation and that concentration makes a difference in terms of explaining, explaining the, the inflation dynamics in the US, the core inflation. So um, have you double checked that for, for other uh, market power measures? Because we know that in macro and in micro, if you throw in different uh, measures of competition or market power, actually results very easily turn around if you take an IO perspective or more an aggregate perspective and so on. So, I think it would be very important to be abroad, and I wonder whether, uh, you know, if for other measures of market power or, you know, then concentration, this is, it looks as beautiful as an explanatory variable as it does in that one. We haven't done that. Um, let me just say two things. One is that the, the coefficient uh, on concentration is remarkably stable. So we can take the data back to 1977. So I'll just show you, you know, a relatively short sample, but we can go back further. It's completely stable. Um, the Grunard paper shows that the profit margins are highly connected, strongly connected to the level of concentration. So there's micro evidence. And if profit margins, you know, if the gap between cost and, and, and uh, revenue um, is strongly affected by concentration, that suggests you know, circumstantial evidence that there should be a macro effect as well. But you're, you're right, we, we should certainly explore other measures of, of market power. Thank you. Any other? I mean, one question I wanted to ask, if uh, if I can abuse of my uh, of my position, is um, that in the in the back and forth between data and modeling that you've uh, described and led you to your conclusions, um, it's it's always a, a, there are cycles. No, sometimes uh, uh, theory is uh, is leading data, sometimes data is leading theory, and theory catches up, etc. And so how, how, how would you qualify these current uh, circumstances, circumstances in terms of what data has to tell us? And that's a, the reason I'm asking the question is that we've invested a lot in central banks, including in the ECB, on building uh, micro uh, databases, um, uh, matching uh, macro data and, and bank data in particular, but not only. And now we have a tsunami of, uh, of big data coming. Um, so. I would, that may be a more philosophical question, but uh, how will that shape uh, the way we uh, we do uh, we do modeling? Looking forward. I'm I'm very enthusiastic about um, what's coming out of microdata. Um, I mean, as I, as I said, some of the micro evidence that's coming out on, on credit constraints, liquidity constraints, buffer stock behavior you know, is very consistent with the theoretical work um, inspired by. As Joe Stiglitz, that uh, Angus Deaton and, and Chris Carroll have done. Um, so you know the fact is strongly confirmed by the by the micro evidence is, is very is very good. The limitation very often is that panel panel data are pretty short. 
So they don't tell you much about what happens when there's a big structural change in the economy. Now, you know, so in other words, we can find, let's say, quite strong housing wealth effects or housing collateral effects in recent US panel data or Australian panel data or Norwegian panel data. Um, but that doesn't tell us how things have evolved over time. And for that, you need a long history. And macro data is, is all we have in order to discuss long histories. And I think it's really important that modelers look at long, the, long, the long historical record. Um, part of the reason is that structural breaks happen. And by controlling for them in the past to see what effect they had in the past, it makes you more humble about the future. It makes you think, well, there could be another structural breaks. What might it, what might it do? Uh, what are the implications for financial stability, for example? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, one, other, one last question. Yes, please. Thank you. I, uh, I'm happy to see the macro finance research is moving towards recognizing that perhaps there are phases where the trend uh, that we observe is an excess trend, then we revert perhaps to a different equilibrium, a different state, which is actually a partial correction of an unsustainable path. I think that's part of what we can do to interpret things, which is more useful than just assume there is a bad shock and that we need to go back to where we deserve to be, because I don't think that's realistic. But here is my question. If that's the case, if we correct it after the crisis and move to a sort of lower growth trend that is maybe a little more realistic, and the question is what can monetary policy do? Can monetary policy do more than subtract from the future to bring to today? Um, are we affecting the future trend? by sort of alleviating the current circumstances. I'd like Mark to answer that question. So let me bundle, bundle that question with, uh, with uh, Yanis uh, Sonar's question, and then we'll uh, come back to John. Thank you. I think uh, there are, we had two excellent presentations. Uh, one question for John uh, Muhlbauer, the other for um, Roger Farmer. Um, so the conclusion that the dynamics to has general equilibrium models have failed, more or less failed, uh, does it lead to us to um, come back to older, few, few equations, model like one price equation, one, uh, wage equation plus ISLM? Um, this is my first question. The second question um, goes to Roger Farmer. Uh, your, your diagram which shows the integration between unemployment rate and real wealth. The causality is uh, which from uh, the unemployment rate uh, to real wealth or the other way around? Because I can think of theories um, justifying both kinds of causality. So this is one of the problems we have in, uh, in this kind of, uh, of correlations. Thank you. Yes, are we simply postponing problems to the future um, through monetary policy? Well, the um, John Duke diagram of the financial accelerator in, in the US, I think, made it very clear that if there had not been very strong state intervention, we would have had a crisis worse than the 1930s. Um, so in that sense, I you know, very much agree with Roger that um, there are multiple equilibria possible, and policy can shift us to different equilibria. Um, one of the problems of monetary policy, and I, I've been worried about this for years now, partly because of my research on the role of debt and uh, asset prices. You know, if you encourage the build-up of debt through low interest rates, then of course that subtracts from future consumption. And you know, our models make that a lot more precise than, than, than we had before. Um, on the other hand, to do nothing uh, um, leads to the, the hysteresis issues that, um, that Roger was talking about, um, the decay of capital, the um, um, the lack of um, building human capital uh, among the population and so on. So it's a fine balance between the two. And my view, of course, is that fiscal policy should have taken by now much more of, of the strain, uh, particularly on the investment side, um, and not left so much to monetary policy. On the question of um, 
price wage equation ISLM. Well, you know, I'm not very enthusiastic about simple models. They can provide you know, nice kind of um, um, sketches of reality, but without credit markets and understanding the linkages between credit markets and asset prices and the housing market, you know, ISLM really, uh, really doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't handle it. So very quickly, so the, the causality uh, in terms of Granger causality tests runs from the asset market to unemployment, but there are two ways of thinking about that. So I, I, I call one uh, the, the weather forecast model. So you know, if, if you wake up, if you, if you go to bed at night and you watch the news and the news says it's going to rain tomorrow, um, the, the, the weather forecast Granger causes the rain, but it's probably not very helpful to issue a directive to the weather forecast to, to say it's not going to be raining, instead it's going to be sunny. So that's one view of what's happening. The other is, is the Keynes beauty contest view, or a, a, I call it, the, you know, think of a, a forest fire. If, if you drop a, a lighted match in a dry forest, you're going to set off uh, a forest fire. If you stop people from smoking, you'll probably prevent forest fires. So the real question is, 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 it, is it a causal link in the second sense? And, and my view is yes to that. But you, it's uh, that would take much longer to explain. By the book. By the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll we'll read the book, and uh, meanwhile, uh, Marcus, the floor is yours. Yours for this for the second part of the.